Is it dark in here? It is a wee bit dark. Yeah. Hey, Google, turn on all the lights. Ooh. <laughs> turning on eight lights. All right. <laughs> Don't go on about it. <laughs> Do you put that at the start? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Gaps in Knowledge podcast. I'm Reese, and I'm a geographer that knows nothing about history. And I'm Will, I'm a historian who knows nothing about geography. And we are on a quest to fit each other's Gaps, gaps in, in knowledge. knowledge. Will we try this? Let's get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Will, how are you doing? I am all right, thank you. It's holiday time for us, which means I've spent most of my time sat on the sofa doing nothing. Yeah, pretty much same for me, actually. Yeah. yeah. But it is holiday time, and uh, that means we can record this podcast on Wednesday during mm-hmm. the day. Mm-hmm. That's unusual. A bit weird. Peak brain time, that. Absolutely. Yeah, well, we're kind of, my brain's frazzled. Yeah, me too. I barely know where I am. Yeah. Putting this together, although putting this, to, putting this um, research together was good fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it did take a, feel like it took a lot longer than it should have done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. But any plans for the Easter? Uh, we are off to England for the first time since we moved here. Uh, so for the first time in almost two years, because we couldn't go for Christmas because because of the French, classic the French, classic French, and we couldn't go last summer because uh, why couldn't we go last summer? Oh yeah, because we were busy. Um, so finally going to go off to England for a bit. Ah, cool, which is nice. I'm going to eat so many pasties. I think that's what you do, isn't it? That is what you do. Yeah. Eat pasties and grumble about the weather. That's, uh, that's what we offer to Germany when we <laughs> over here. Um, I'm going to Denmark. How about you? Denmark. Denmark, Excellent. yeah. Excellent. Whereabouts? So we're going to Copenhagen in mm-hmm. the last week of our holidays, and we're going to see David Threya, which is the Icelandic Eurovision Song Cost entry from last year. <laughs> so that's <laughs> what we're doing. Fair enough. <laughs> Quite a unique reason to go yeah, to Copenhagen. Absolutely. But yeah. Should be good. Yeah, for, yeah two days. Good. Chris and I will go there and, yeah. Have you been before? Uh, I went with my nan to Copenhagen, where, interestingly, we were hit by the same storm twice. How? Because <laughs> we flew out uh, right. during a storm. Okay. And then as we flew to Copenhagen eastwards, we overtook the storm, landed, and then the storm caught up with us and hit us again. <laughs> so that's how I got hit by the same storm twice. It does twice. seem as though your holidays are just being chased by natural disasters all over the world. I think it's being a geographer. Right. Uh, maybe I, it gravitates towards me. Like a magnet. Yeah. For weather. Absolutely, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. But, um, I'm yeah. worried now. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a big storm. Well, the big storm that comes over Duisburg. Mm-hmm. But it is, it is unseasonably cold at the moment. It here. is flipping freezing, literally on yeah. some days. Yeah. Sucks. Does suck. So happy holidays. Ha- happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to go into Misconception Corner. We For, are indeed, yeah. Who goes first this time? You go first. I think it's me first. going first this you time. First you this did time. the uh, history one last time. So indeed. I have a question for you oh for Misconception Corner. Right. My question is, where are you most likely to be hit by a tornado? When you're with Reese Mortley. Most likely, <laughs> yes. Twice, maybe in the same day if you're lucky. <laughs> uh, tornado. So I'm thinking kind of Dust Bowl of the US. That's mm. known for its tornadoes. Um, or the Caribbean, but that's more hurricanes than tornadoes. Not that I know the difference. And that's in, so one of the differences, students at school, as we know, get things wrong all the time. Mm-hmm. One of the biggest ones is the difference between a tornado and a hurricane. And actually, that happens quite a lot in, in media and literature as well. People mm-hmm. get those two commonly mixed up. Hurricanes are mass, massive storms in the sky with the big eye in the middle. Right. Nothing spouts down from a, from a hurricane, and they're massive. They can cover the whole of the eastern USA. Okay. Whereas a tornado is a localized storm. Right. Uh, which is just a, a, a swirling vortex of air that comes down from a cumulonimbus cloud. Right. Essentially. Okay. So a tornado would wipe out a building. Yes. A hurricane would wipe out a state. Yeah. Or a uh, city. Or a city. Or even when New Orleans is the best example yeah. for that in 2005, with Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy in New York in 2012, mm-hmm. uh, wipe out whole cities. Whereas tornadoes do wipe out cities, but quite often they're even localized within the city. Right. Uh, depends how big they are. I think the widest tornado ever recorded was two miles wide okay that's pretty impressive that is but we're saying that's massive yeah i think it was a tri-state hurricane in 1931 in oklahoma uh-huh. so it was, was pretty wide in the dust um 
But we're talking about USA here, aren't we? That yeah. seems to where you gravitate towards with, think with, so. with tornadoes. Uh, you're not wrong in saying that's where the most tornadoes happen. Mm-hmm. However, the, most, the highest density of tornadoes per square kilometre is what we're after here. Okay. Now, this is quite surprising. Now, some people, some listeners might know this, but actually the highest density of tornadoes happens in England. What? Wait, what? Yeah, it's crazy, isn't <laughs> okay. it? Okay. So, the, so let me give some facts here just to put this into, into context. So the UK has the most tornadoes per uh, area per year. So it's 0.14 tornadoes. I don't even have a tenth of a tornado, but <laughs> per 1,000 kilometres. Right. However, they are generally quite weak tornadoes. Mm-hmm. And it's very rare to see them because they're so weak. Whereas in the US, they have... Um, so this is what I've done. This is how tired I've been over the holidays. So I've done first off 1,000 kilometers squared. Then I've measured the US one in 10,000 kilometers squared. Okay. Uh, but I've also done the British one and the English one in 10,000 kilometers squared. I don't know what's wrong with me. So <laughs> in England... It's the holidays. That's, yeah, what's, wrong that's what's wrong with me. It's the holidays. <laughs> so, that, so we are on the same conversion rate. Mm-hmm. In England, they experience 2.2 tornadoes per year per 10,000 kilometers squared. Okay. That's a bit of word salad. I'm yeah. aware. However, in the US, uh, which also includes Alaska and Hawaii, mm. <laughs> they have 1.3 tornadoes annually for 10,000 kilometers squared. Right. Okay. Problem is, though, USA is massive yeah. and they have, like, they have the biggest tornadoes. Mm. Yeah, and then that, that's, that's really clear and the most deadliest tornadoes. Mm. Um, but yeah, there are other places around the world that have tornadoes that pe- often people don't think about. We're, where we're sitting now, Will, mm-hmm. we're in North Rhine-Westphalen, we're in Duisburg, Germany. Mm-hmm. This is Tornado Alley of Europe. <laughs> of course it is, because <laughs> they seek you out like a yeah. guided missile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm shifting boundaries for tornadoes to come over here. Um, but the other place which they, uh, th- th- there is a tornado alley in uh, Asia as well, and it's mm-hmm. in Bangladesh, uh, and they have tornadoes which, now I'll put this into context, they've had tornadoes that kill up to 2,000 people. Wow. Which is quite significant. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people for a localized storm. Oh my goodness. Whereas like in US, I think there was one in Joplin in 2011 that killed 100, no, 389, mm. and, and that was a significant a death lot of toll. still. Yeah, but... but wow. and, but you know, we, as we talked about briefly, briefly Bangladesh last week, mm, very so dense. Yeah. yeah, so that's why, and obviously oh. not as developed. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so, and uh, oh, lastly, tornadoes have never been experienced on Antarctica, the only continent where there has been no tornado. No tornadoes ever. Whatsoever. Okay. Well, so what I'm trying to figure out then is what causes a tornado, because I'm sure, sorry, Mr. Pettit, my year eight geography teacher, I have forgotten (laughs) in the intervening decades. So uh, just to summarize it very quickly, you need hot air, you need Mm. cold air. They need to be coming towards one another. Right. And so much so hot air rises, Mm -hmm. cold air uh, air sinks, it sits underneath. Mm -hmm. As it's doing that, we have the Coriolis effect where the earth spins. Mm -hmm. And as that's all happening together, you get a huge cumulonimbus cloud. Here's the thing, though. That is as much as most people know about tornadoes. That's probably why they form. It is still under debate exactly the real mechanics of a tornado and oh, wow. why they happen. Okay. Yeah. So it could be Tasmanian devils. Could well be. Yeah. Uh huh. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so then the UK is particularly susceptible because it's an island next to the Gulf Stream? Is that Pretty right? much. Okay. Yeah. We get hot, hot African warm air coming up mm. from the south and we've got cool Arctic air coming from the north and usually mm. wet as well. And that is a combination for uh, big storms to Tornado. happen over England and tornadoes can sprout out of these cumulonimbus clouds. Oh, wow. We're talking about clouds now. Mm-hmm. You know, there are only two types of rain clouds. I didn't know. If they have the word nimbus in, mm. it's a rain cloud. Right. So cumulonimbus nimbus and nimbostratus. They are the right. only two type of clouds that produce rain. Aha. Uh-huh. I, I had no idea. Bonus fact. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and do they look different from the ground? Cumulonimbus ones are the really tall, huge column ones. They're okay. massive. My hands are up. They're huge and, you, and they, they like hit the sky like really high up and you and you look at it and you go oh that's a bit ominous mm-hmm. <laughs> whereas the ones that we've seen at the moment in Duisburg are nimbostratus rain clouds which are pretty boring rain clouds uh-huh. they're the ones that produce all that drizzle horrible rain ah so they do produce different kinds of rain oh yeah absolutely so what you want is a good cumulonimbus oh yeah that's yeah. exciting there's okay. a lot happening when that's- we what gets the elbow patches twitching at the Royal Geographical oh. Society? <laughs> <laughs> they will be. Yes, they'll need some new. We need some new seams soon. <laughs> <laughs> but cumulonimbus—that's just what that's 
No, Stratonimbus is what the UK has most of the time. Yeah, it's this called... Crizzle. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's frontal rainfall. Right. So it comes over from the West. They have what they call depressions that come from West to East. And yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's the UK. <laughs> there you yeah. go. A depressive frontal rainfall yeah. movement. Yeah, it comes yeah. from the Atlantic. Uh-huh. And it rains in the UK on average three days a week. Uh-huh. And so you don't get tornadoes in Antarctica because there's no meeting of cold and hot. Correct. Yeah. Ah. You learned something. There you go. You put something. it all together. <laughs> I win this podcast. You do today. Well, yeah. one nil. One nil. <laughs> there's five, there's five, more, right. five more fixtures left and Let's I want to hear the next one. If we can one. get you to score a massive own goal here. <laughs> What do you know about the Victorians? Nothing, really. <laughs> Absolutely nothing at all. But I'm just going to embarrass myself trying to work it out. Mm-hmm. Queen Victoria. Yes, correct. Okay, okay so strong got, start. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've got Queen Victoria. Mm-hmm. Um, time period 1800s? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, that's yep. not bad. That's a good guess. That's good. So 1837 to 1901. Okay. Queen Victoria. I, I don't want to do a fur because I'm on a winning streak. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> Um, what's the kind of popular conception of the Victorians? How do we see the Victorian people? Oh, they're always... I, so when, I, when, I see, when I think Victorian, mm. very prudish. Very prudish. Oh, yes. Very repressed. Very, yes, and very oh, sort of, you know, like hand over mouth when you yawn and don't, mm-hmm. you know, make sure you have to eat your dinner correctly with the right cutlery mm-hmm. and make sure that you're... Go to finishing school. That's mm-hmm. the thing, isn't it? Where yeah. You, yeah, so that kind of thing. Where a big emphasis on etiquette. Yeah, huge emphasis. Behavior. They yeah. would be excellent golfers. Because <laughs> <laughs> all golfers are prudes. <laughs> <laughs> I was linking it to the word etiquette, but <laughs> what's the link? I. All right, golfers are very. You have to have strong etiquette to go around a golf. Which you know, really? in Germany, to be able to play golf, you have to go through a test, like a driving test, to e- make sure that your etiquette is perfect. E- Sorry. <laughs> really? Absolutely. That's insane. What in case so you don't cough at the wrong point and put uh, someone it, off? Yeah, yeah, that. And if you um that you know how to repair a divot in the grounds, you know that how to putt on the green so you don't disrupt anyone. Wow. Yeah. It's that's why it's an elitist sport here in Germany. And that's, that's why there's insane. only two professional German golfers at the moment. Because there's, there's no one... nobody else polite enough to play. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I'd stand by my assessment that golf is just a good walk ruined. Absolutely. I often, I play golf. It's one mm. of my main sports. Um, and uh, I still stand by that. <laughs> the way I play sometimes. Just go for a walk in the woods instead. Yeah, you could do. Mm. Yeah. And then you could hit trees with mm. others. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but this might get arrested for that in Germany as well. Could Maybe well do. Better. Oh yeah, they big strong on that as well. We're, mm. We digress. We do digress, <laughs> but that, hey, it's the podcast. What are you going to do? Exactly. Um, yeah, etiquette and, and being prudish in particular. Mm. There's the old... Um, there's a whole loads of myths about Victorians and being prudish. Like women weren't allowed to ride horses sat straight on. They had to ride side saddle. And that probably is true because if you ride straight on, then think of the position of your legs. They've got to be open. Yeah. Because if you oh, ride side saddle, you can close your legs. That's true. You're not, yeah. no, there's no, nothing on show. No, exactly. <laughs> but there's a myth, which hmm. you might have heard before, which is that Victorians were so prudish that they would cover, cover up their piano legs. Yes, I've heard this, and I mm. thought it was true. They would cover up their piano legs because they thought it was very rude to show off their piano legs. Exactly, yeah, which is which is like a popular yeah. myth of the Victorians. They're, oh, God, they're so prudish that you can't even have piano legs showing. They'll keep their piano legs warm. <laughs> Pianos aren't alive. <laughs> That's not how music yeah. works. <laughs> oh, I see. I got that one wrong. <laughs> you don't. You're not literally tickling the ivories to make it sing. That is a metaphor. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, I've okay. been doing it wrong this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why you're banned from the music department. It is why I'm banned from the music department. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a myth. It's, it was made oh, up. Completely really? That, made up. What, was it yeah. made up because it was convenient? Well, here's the thing. It was made up by the Victorians themselves <laughs> about the Americans. Oh, really? Yeah. It was the... The earliest quote we could find, and this all comes from an article in History Today um, that was out this month, uh, the earliest quote we could find is from 1843 where uh, a writer said that the Americans would furnish their pianos with trousers because in that virtuous country, bare legs are held to be unbecoming. Good use of the word unbecoming. unbecoming, Exactly. (laughs) Quite like that. So no, it's, it's laughing at the Americans. Look at how prudish they are. They can't even have piano legs out without getting all horny. And then the French, 
Oh, where we go? The French. Oh, we're going back to the French. They hear the joke. Yes. And they use it on the English. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it ends up being about the English. That's bloody the, French again. By the 1860s, the French are now reporting that the English put trousers on their piano legs and on their tables and on their chairs. Was, was their house just a whole trouser? <laughs> just a big trouser. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And it's, then in the final twist, the English then take it to laugh at the English themselves. Oh. Like, look how funny the Victorians were. So it's a myth that's gone through evolution. It's a cultural myth. It because is. Because it's quite embed, embedded, sorry. It is, absolutely. It's, it's when you think of the Victorians, you think they're prudish, and you think, oh yeah, piano legs. I see. Can't look at them. But if you think about it, there's nothing horny about a piano leg. No, not really. Not really. Not really. I can't find any way in which you can, well, <laughs> depends a bit. The, well, I'll the, leave that <laughs> to you and your imagination. <laughs> All I thought of was what do you call a person that plays a piano? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> that could be fair enough. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe, Maybe put the trousers is. over the pianist. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be okay. And we'll all be okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it's only... Should I do my um, job fact, uh, the main one? Yes. So you're like this. The title of my one for the gap filling <laughs> is called A CD Dungeon. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why you're banned from the music department. It is why I'm banned from the music department. <laughs> so um, have you heard of the archipelago called Svalbard? Svalbard, yes, I have. Up in... It's part of Norway, isn't it? It is part of Norway, mm -hmm. yeah. It's very far north. Mm -hmm. It's. I mean, in like, Norway is north. Mm. And then... This is North Norway. North Norway land-based stuff is like Tromsø. Mm -hmm. And then you keep going, you've got a bit of ocean, and then you've got Svalbard, mm -hmm. very isolated. And that's a really important part of this. Okay. Okay, so in, a, in Svalbard, there's something called a seed vault. A seed vault. Seed vault. Mm -hmm. And this seed vault is built into the um, archipelago mountainside that exists within Svalbard. An underground seed vault. Underground seed vault. Wow. Where in this seed vault, they have every single seed that's ever been planted, ever, in sort of modern history, I suppose, in the world. Oh, wow. 930,000 different varieties of seeds. Wow. Which See, I think is quite impressive. That is. They're very close to having a million they, they are. They are. They're, 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 they're actually, I've read an article recently, they're really quite excited about getting these seeds into the seed vault. But, I the, bet. but to put this into context, why do, why do we need to store all the seeds in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when there might be a war? What happens when there might be uh, impacts of climate change? And all of a sudden, people have to migrate and move and then restart their crops over again. Mm -hmm. And this is where the seed vault comes into play. It is a security bank mm -hmm. for uh, collecting seeds just in case. Just in case. There, we need to repopulate a crop field or mm. restart the, the crop fields again to uh, allow for no to have food security for people that might have to migrate or move or their lands have been destroyed. Oh, wow. And they keep this uh, seed vault in Svalbard. Uh huh. Because can you imagine why they might keep it in Svalbard? Well, I was guessing because it's cold and so they can't germinate. Yes, that's one thing. But you mm. could also like build one of these things somewhere else and then cool it. Would be a lot of energy, I suppose. Mm. Um, but no, it's uh, because it's so isolated mm -hmm. and so unlikely to be part of a war. Ah, right. That they, they, it's just the safest place to have something which is so important to food security around the world. Right. So in the, inside this building, this is where we might be across curricular, there is 13,000 years of agricultural history. Wow. So, they've, so this is like all agricultural seeds that have ever been, have ever been planted, planted ever been found are put into this place and obviously they, they do research to find some more seeds that are mm. not yet in this so there is a little bit of an article where they're really excited they're nearly at a million seeds do you think they'll give up once they get to a million maybe <laughs> oh, we found everything uh hang on that's a new looking rose isn't it nope <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it in, not do you want to put it in the seed vault no, no now we're full <laughs> we didn't expect the counter which they clip all the seeds covered in is exceeding nine nine nine, nine 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 we can't do any more um but it, a little bit of history here so uh, the idea it was conceived in 1980 by someone called Carrie Fowler, who was mm -hmm. a former executive uh, director of the Crop Trust okay. in 1930. Uh, and uh, the goal is to find and house a copy of every unique seed that exists in the global gene banks. And uh, so that's what, so it's, it's a way of protecting global food security moving forward. Uh, and the Global Seed Vault is dubbed as the Doomsday Vault. The Doomsday Vault. Which I think is quite a cool name that is, for something yeah. like that. 
But the, yeah, so they say so the reason that it's in this place is away from war and terror. Um, mm. But which I think is also a really interesting idea. If you wanted to literally fuck everything up, head there. Like I feel like I might be doing the global food security a disservice <laughs> if someone listened to this, didn't know about this, mm. and was that way inclined. inclined. Yeah, like an absolute uber mega villain. Yeah, just destroy destroy civilization's library essentially they would but they would also find it very difficult and okay. this is the thing because they're polar bears well there's polar bears but let's not forget 2,000 3,000 people live in Svalbard the capital is Longyearbyen by the way Longyearbyen Longyearbyen which is quite oh. a cool name I think yes. it was the first the founder's name of this island was called Longyearbyen right which is also quite a weird surname name her after himself pretty much yeah isn't that how it normally happens well we talked about the Canaries before yeah <laughs> Columbia I didn't find Columbia <laughs> District of Columbia he didn't find that either no Amerigo Vespucci named America after himself, but he didn't find it either. He just drew a map. I see. Yeah. I can't think of anywhere that's named after someone that was... No, so maybe this is the only place. Long absolutely year. will be, and we're going to look like complete idiots for not knowing. Of course. Know. So there's one right at the tip of our, or There'd be one obvious one that you completely missed. Vasco da Gama Football Club. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know the guy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we did talk about Mr. Rochester in the... Um, he didn't the, discover the town of Rochester. No, he didn't. City of Rochester. Let's so, get oh, that correct. It has, a, it has a cathedral. <laughs> Some of my friends listening to this are from Rochester. Sorry, I, I went to school in Rochester. I apologise to the... <laughs> County of Kent? County, of, county of Kent. Or is it just uh, a mess? It's, <laughs> county of Kent. I'm in trouble. <laughs> you owe a lot of trouble. It's actually under Medway Town um, jurisdiction. Yeah, you don't want to mess with no. Medway. Do you know who they call Kent the Garden of England? Because it's... Well, they call it... Detritus. Well, maybe. <laughs> I'm but in they big call, trouble. Yeah, you're in a lot of trouble. Like, You've lived in Canterbury. <laughs> yeah, I'm not proud of it. <laughs> but they... So it's called the Garden of England. I always yeah. imagine Medway is like the, the bit where you... Make the bonfires. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's that's what right. Medway is. That's, that's where Medway. I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> that's where all my friends are from. <laughs> so they're going to hate me later. Um, there was a couple of things I wanted to, to talk about. So, mm. so one of the one of the worries about food security in the future is that we are becoming as a population too reliant on a, food. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> You might sound silly after that. <laughs> <laughs> because as population is growing, mm. there is a high demand for food. Yep. As the population is growing, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Southeast Asia as well, as where it's really heavily grown. Mm -hmm. The thing is, crop yields have increased, but biodiversity has decreased to the I point see. that now only 30 crops provide 95% of food, human food energy needs. Wow, that is stunning. 30 crops? Yeah. We could probably name them. Yes, I haven't got We're them not listed. Going to, that would be extraordinarily <laughs> boring. Yeah, it would but be. But we could probably name them. Yeah. That's, it's, that's nuts, nuts, isn't it? Yeah. But it's probably not going to grow nuts. <laughs> 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 but I know it, it's wow. mad. Uh, so, um, so only 10% of the rice varieties that China used in 1950s are still used today, so, uh, for example. So, wow. Which is crazy. So, so Chinese rice crops have now decline in biodiversity that they only rely on a couple of them to feed billions of people over a billion people and so is that because we are selecting the most efficient crops yes okay genetically because... modified crops to meet the growing population demand because what that reminds me of is monsanto the massive agri chemical agricultural company that mm -hmm. kind of provides all of the plant crops in the u.s was suing some indian farmers for growing seeds that they had patented Oh, so you can what? patent a specific seed mm. in order that no one else can grow that kind of crop. Oh, wow. So that's what I was thinking, that are we talking about the most efficient kind of crop or are we talking about the capitalization of crop? Oh, I see. So it actually is kind of a capitalist mm. idea. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So there's only 30 different kinds of crops or the biodiversity has decreased so much because they're all held in the hands of a couple of massive Oh, that's a really good point, businesses. actually. So you can only, you only buy seeds because there are so few. We buy it from us. Yeah. We capitalize on the fact that the biodiversity is declining. Mm. Oh, my God. And I'd, I remember reading that, the, that Monsanto had managed to genetically modify seeds so that if they fell off the crop and landed in the ground, they then wouldn't germinate. They oh, my God. They could only God. germinate if you used Monsanto branded products. <laughs> How evil. Wow. That? That's like, and this is going to sound very nerdy, that's like, for example, having get an in-game currency of V-Bucks from Fortnite, but you mm -hmm. can't spend them, let's say, on Destiny 2. Yeah. 
that you have to only have yeah. it on our... So the in-game currency of food, of f- <laughs> <laughs> which is a necessity. My God. For human life. That's it's crazy. crazy. Well, yeah. That, I can kind of... That's a very American way, dare I say, in terms mm. of its capitalistic ideas. Make money off it. Make money off it. If you make money off it, it's good. Yeah, and that's how you measure success in the US, isn't it, normally? Mm. But then just to add to this, the, the problem that we... So uh, maybe I'm just thinking of, of maybe of a good sort of idea here. So What, for a business? <laughs> you can branch out from teaching. No, it's a way to explain. <laughs> but now I'm thinking of business ideas. Should we do that? That's a I good idea. sue some Indian farmers. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make here is that um, there is a mono cult a monoculture nature of agriculture which leaves food supplies more susceptible to threats such as diseases and and drought mm. but that that's the problem like so one of the biggest threats that farmers face if they use for example just one crop type across their whole field is that if they have one disease it wipes out that whole yield for that specific year yeah and they lose all their money for it whereas yeah. you diversify your crops you, you, the risk of that happening is a lot lower and you still you might have a slightly lower yield as a result of that crop, uh, if you have a bit of a disease, but you can still make a lot enough money to be able to, and enough food to be supply uh, and to keep the food security uh, good. Um, but it's a, uh, yeah, so that's kind of. Um, you know what the problem with that kind of thinking is, though? What is? That's giving up the short term in favor of the long term. And no one likes that's that. Not how human that's why no one invests in wind turbines. No. Because exactly. the lag time of money returned is about 25 years. Yeah. So why would you want to invest in something which is, you know, that's why you do stocks. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's why I ate 20 euros worth of sushi and a pizza last night. Yeah. Short term, tasted delicious. Long term, I don't feel very good right now. No, absolutely. <laughs> <A bit nauseous. laughs> Economically feel awful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the moment, living in the moment, it feels I great. Did, I did enjoy, I did enjoy that pizza. Yeah. Um, speaking of food. <laughs> <laughs> not fisheries, not doing agriculture or aquaculture. So Because there's only so much we can take right now. That and really I told is. her about fisheries. <laughs> We can talk about aquaculture. That's a whole other <laughs> kettle of fish entirely. Literally. If you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Would you think that so far in this world there has been a withdrawal uh, for um, uh, the seed vault in Svalbard? Has someone taken something out? Yet? Hmm. So, hmm. think of are there enough calamities in the world that there's literally been a wipeout of a particular seed? I mean, we do think that we are living through the most calamitous part hmm. of world history ever, but so has literally everyone ever. So, I mean, the world now is probably worse than it was 20 years ago. Mm. Probably not worse than it was, certainly not worse than it was 80 years ago. So mm. I don't know. I think, I think we're doing just about okay enough to not have to. And I'm going to be proven wrong now, aren't I? Yeah, proven wrong is one. Okay. One withdrawal, which just is actually one. pretty good going, to be that fair. That is quite good going. That's quite one, one withdrawal from the World yeah, uh, Food Security 000. Bank, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is due to the Syrian war. Okay. Uh, so, so the International Centre of... <laughs> You'll love this name. They've had to abbreviate this, by the way. Okay. <laughs> the International Centre for Agriculture Research in the Dry Areas. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yes, right. That's not going to roll off the tongue. You're at a meeting, that's a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you from? The dry areas. Yeah. The, so they call it the ICADA, which I quite like. Uh-huh. That's the, the, it's a global one. agricultural research <laughs> uh, organisation that was based in Syria. Mm-hmm. And due to the ongoing right. war there, they actually had to... Uh, initially, it was the international employees... They moved the base over to Morocco and, and Libya. Also dry. Yeah, also because they have to, and, mm. and Algeria, I think, as well. They moved over to there to continue their research due to the uh, Syrian war. Mm. Some of the Syrian uh, natives there who worked for the, for the organization stayed there to try and salvage a lot of the equipment and a lot of the seeds that were, that were working on, but unfortunately they had to evacuate as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as a result of that, they lost uh, a significant amount of their um, seeds they were working on. Uh, and as a result, they had to take a withdrawal from the uh, Svalbard Seed Vault to continue their research in Morocco mm-hmm. and uh, well, Northern Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the spokespersons who works at the Svalbard uh, Seed Vault, mm. uh, he, he, he's quite obviously very proud of, of working there. So as he would be. It is, I didn't maybe didn't give you the dimensions of it actually. So it's actually like four hundred and thirty feet underground. Just nice. want to make that very clear. So it's pretty, it's solid in the mountain. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's got a big front. It actually looks quite impressive. Here's a picture of it. And I urge listeners to go and look. Maybe I'll tweet it actually. And mm-hmm. then you can look at a picture of the of the front door. It's quite quite futuristic. And it, you have like a 110 meter tunnel to go awesome. into it. It's kept at a really low temperature Good. and all this kind of stuff. So it's pretty solid in Depending there. And it, it does have security as well. But one of the spokespersons says it's it's one of the only places in the world where there is national like international harmony. Uh-huh. Because he's he says. Red wooden boxes from North Korea 
sits alongside black boxes from the US. Over on the next aisle, boxes of seeds from Ukraine sit atop seeds from Russia. The seeds don't care that there are North <laughs> Korean seeds and South Korean seeds in the same aisle. They are go. cold and safe up there, and that's all that really matters. There you go. And that's his view. That's his, that's World his... harmony from plants. Yeah. Maybe the Rastafarians do have it right. <laughs> Maybe they do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's the, that's, uh, the sea vault in Svalbard. Yeah. And while we're on Svalbard, would you like to know the most northern lees of in Svalbard? Uh, go for it. Okay, so the most northerly airport in the world is in Svalbard. Of course. The most northerly piano is in Svalbard. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> legs covered up for heat purposes this time. Yes, absolutely. They need yeah. to put the, the they need to put the, the leg warmers on. on this piano. <laughs> <laughs> the most northern per, northerly per, um, community or mm-hmm. uh, permanently permanently, pop, inhabited. permanently there inhabited. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Is a knee Alsund uh, is in north nor, uh, Svalbard. I didn't right. like <laughs> very north. Uh, it has a post office, which is the most normally post office Excellent. <laughs> as well. How many people live there? Uh, know it's it? like 50, I think. 40. 50 people. Yeah, something like that. So and then, most... But some are like generally native to it as well. Oh, okay. So it's quite, like, there are obviously people that work that there. I think there. they operate radio stations and things like that. They're mm. six months of the year and they swap. Uh, but there are a couple of people that live there full time. Full time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, which is interesting in the sense that um, you don't need a visa to go and live in Svalbard oh, or work. You? No, you just just turn Even up. Even though it's, it's part of Norway. It's part of Norway. Just rock yeah. up and go, I want to work here. And they go, yeah, right, you can, because it's so probably cold and horrible. Polar vest, stamp Polar your bear. passport as you come in. Yeah. <laughs> it's also illegal not to carry a gun outside of a settlement. <laughs> not to. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because yeah. of the bears. Because of the polar bears. Very similar to a city in Yellowknife in Canada where it's illegal uh-huh. to lock your car. <laughs> in case a bear needs it for emergency. Yes, in case the bear needs to get hostile. Quite the opposite. Just in case uh-huh. there's a bear near you, you need to escape. Uh-huh. You can go into a car. So they will have to be left unlocked. Unlocked, yeah. Oh, wow. There's a hell of a trust in your population. That is, <laughs> yeah. But then, I mean, to be fair, like Yellowknife, I'm presuming, we're talking up in the Arctic Circle. Yeah, we're pretty north. Where we're are in you driving the, to? Like Yukon, right. sort of areas. Uh-huh. They're really far north. So you nick a car and then, what, drive it around the back of the village? <laughs> you can't go anywhere with Jim. No. <laughs> One road out. <laughs> Jim, can you bring my car back, please? <laughs> and you probably know the person who stole it, to yeah. be fair, as well. Yeah, good point. <laughs> There's just 50 people there. <laughs> I have no bears, Jim. Give me back my car. Yeah. And uh, most northerly, you'll like this because we were just talking about this. Most northerly, pizzeria, kebab house, gourmet restaurant, bar, nightclub, and sushi restaurant. Excellent. So that's at least at least 10 of the 50 population employed there. Yes. <laughs> and the other 40 just do the coldest pub crawl. Coldest pub crawl. Yeah. And one person works in the post office. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a place. It's, a, it's an unbelievable place. And Svalbard yeah. means cold shores in Old Norsk. Right. Which makes sense. That does, yeah, yeah. Cold shores, fair enough. So that's Svalbard. Mm-hmm. That is the um, seed vault mm-hmm. and the most northerly, northerly of normally things. I, I really appreciate the fact that they made it look like an underground lair because it is an underground lair. It is, yeah. And so it needs kind of 100 foot long metal corridors and. It needs that stuff. Security. I'm picturing all in completely black. Silver, like a kind of like starship. Ah, okay. That's but, even better. Which is much cooler. And it just Brilliant. juts out of the, of the mountainside a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's obvious. It's got a nice, I think it's got like a blue window at the top. It's huge, really thick. And it's mm-hmm. quite, you know, you can see it from a distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a like a shining beaming light from a lighthouse, but you can see it in the mountainside. Excellent, yeah, which is really cool. And I, I, you talk about the bar crawl in Svalbard, mm. and that's how you end up in the cold, seedy dungeon <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> Get locked in there overnight to sober up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you just don't eat any of the mustard seeds. <laughs> What do you think the longest you've ever danced for is? Oh, my, the longest dance I've ever done? In, yeah. Do you, are you talking about in one go? Like just, I'm not talking distance, I'm talking time. <laughs> There's a furthest way, place, way I've danced I've at. danced seven no. kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> so the longest in time? Yeah. But I've danced for in one stint Yeah. kind of thing. Oh, I'm, I'm assuming when I was probably... Do you know you used to go to nightclub, under 18 nightclubs and mm-hmm. say your J2Os and that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Probably when I was then, I was a lot fitter and energetic. Probably mm-hmm. three hours. I mm-hmm. would probably do something like that and then yeah. feel it the next morning. Oh, a Metallica concert where I completely shot my legs to shit. Um, <laughs> I mean, in, I had to play football the next day and had uh-huh. to be subbed off the 20 minutes. Oh, wow. So play. I just want to make this really clear. I was the goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, three, maybe, hours. So three hours, maybe two, I think hours. I've done about the same. Mm. We would have kind of dances and stuff at school. And I remember one time I was so sweaty that we all went back to, I went to a boarding school and we went back to someone's dorm and I sat on their bed and got up about half an hour later and the entire bed was drenched in my sweat. Nice. <laughs> enjoy, that. enjoy that. Enjoy <laughs> that. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Three hours is a is a good amount because after that you get tired. You do. You're done. Well, 14th of July, 1518, we're in Strasbourg, which you'd think- Is that France, Germany or France at the moment? Uh, today, France, back then, Germany. Okay. So I'm pushing my limits here a little bit. Yep. I'm not just in France. <laughs> um, uh, a woman called Frau Trophea has an argument with her husband and um, kind of yells at him, jumps out into the street and starts dancing. And- As, mm-hmm keeps on dancing okay and the sun starts to set and she's still dancing is there any music at the moment? there is no music she's just dancing. she is just dancing and she keeps going until night when she collapses out of exhaustion and then the sun comes up and she starts dancing again and a couple of people kind of turn up and go what on earth is going on here why is she dancing so much there's no music there's no music at all she's just dancing in the streets by the third day her feet are bruised and bloody She's bleeding from her feet. Uh-huh. She is sweating. And people are looking at her thinking, why is she dancing this much when she is quite clearly in a lot of agony and a lot of discomfort because she's grimacing. She's not grinning. She's not having a good time. Mm-mm. She's having a horrible time of it. By the eighth day... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have any feet left? <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of bloody stumps. Um, the, the local council realised, we've got to do something about this because... This is weird. It's so, very strange okay, behavior. what do we do? Let's send her off to the church and see what they can do. So <laughs> they bundle her into the back of a cart. Still dancing? Well, they managed to kind of restrain her by tying her up, put her in the back of a cart and take her off to a Didn't shrine. conger her in. <laughs> Not <laughs> congering all the way, no. A one-man conger. Um, so she's sent off to a shrine, and that's the last we ever hear of her. Oh, what? So <laughs> we presume she was cured, because otherwise they would have mentioned it. And so... Cart takes about a day to get up to the shrine, day to get back to Strasbourg. By the time the cart comes back to Strasbourg, 30 people are in the streets dancing oh, in exactly the same way. By the time we get to August, so two weeks later, a hundred people are out in the streets, all of them with bloody feet, all of them grimacing in pain, in what? agony, not having a good time. So the council realized we've got a much bigger problem here than we thought. What can we do? And in a quite spectacular twist of logic, they decide if they're going to dance, let's dance them out. So they set up some musicians and a stage for the people to start dancing too. <laughs> Surely that's just encouraging. This encourages the people. By the end of August, there are 400 people dancing. <laughs> they just make it worse. And, I and, have so many questions in this one. <laughs> and, and like people start bringing their relatives that have just started dancing out of nowhere in the um, houses and they bring them to the dance. And the more people gather, the more the dance takes on a particular form, which is everybody holding hands in a big circle, kind of like the hokey cokey. Oh my God. But without knees bent, arms, arms drenched. Down. Ra, 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 whatever it is. Yeah, remember. that one. Yeah. Um, just kind of circling round and round and round. Everybody in agony, in distress. Some people screaming, saying, help me, help me. What? I can't stop dancing. Um, the church writes a report about this, um, which we've got, where they say, there's been a strange epidemic where people in madness begin dancing, which they keep up day and night without interruption until they fall unconscious. Many have died. What? Death people by start dancing. dancing themselves to death in Strasbourg. Yeah. So the council realised we've got, an enormous problem here. We need to solve this because people are just going to dance themselves to death. And Strasbourg is quite big, about 20,000 people. A lot of people there, yeah. But 400 people dancing. And where they set up the stage was in the middle of the marketplace. So you can't hold a market until you deal with the problem. <laughs> you can't hold the market until you stop the dancing. Yeah, you just imagine yeah. turning up as a merchant. Like, <laughs> Here to sell my carpets. Yeah. Um, are you guys okay? <laughs> Help me, I can't stop dancing! <laughs> I think I'm going to go to the next town. Thanks. Yeah. It's <laughs> mental. So what the council do is they make this enormous wax sculpture of the saint. The saint was called St. Vetus. Um, and the, the, it was his shrine that they took the first lady to, um, Frau Trophea. And so they create this enormous wax sculpture of St. Vetus and they put it in a big cauldron. They put it on the back of a cart 
and they guide the dancing people to the carts and they send the cart off to the shrine in your massive conga line. They so the conga line did happen in the, the end? The conga line did happen, Oh, yes. brilliant. And it's 30 kilometres away. So that's, how far have you danced? That's 30 kilometres. 30 kilometres. <laughs> yeah. And they Dance. guide them up to the shrine and they take them into the chapel that's built at the shrine and they get them to circle around the altar and that does it. They're cured and they all go home. Oh my God. Problem solved. Mental people. Absolutely insane. All are started by one person. One person. Well, there's, this th- have you, there's, a fa- there's a famous YouTube video and, and it's, it's, it's a nice, actually, a nice um, analogy, you can, a nice metaphor you can get from it. So there's one person dancing in a crowd, mm. just one person dancing. You may have seen this before, but, mm. and then suddenly the second person just starts to dance mm. with that one person. So what you've done there is you've increased the amounts of dancers by 100%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, oh, two people then join the other two, or mm-hmm. one person joins again. And then, so, but then everyone that joins decreases the amount of people that have joined as a percentage. Mm-hmm. So, actually, who's the most important person here? It's the second person. Uh-huh. The one that joined the first person dancing right. is the most important person in that idea. Right. You get in a bus and there's one person dancing, they're mental. You get yes. in a bus and there's two person, people dancing. Party, that's a party bus. Let's go. That is the party bus. Yeah, that's the one. Definitely so, good time. So, so absolutely, the first that first woman. Yeah, she's nuts. Yeah, but then someone else went. I want some of that. <laughs> Let's join her. And that caused, and that uh, caused it to happen. The maybe epidemic. that's maybe some waiting to that to a certain extent. There, no, absolutely, yeah, because this isn't an isolated case. <laughs> but what's interesting is <laughs> I that, just had flashbacks of. <laughs> Pick us in court. This yeah. is not, not an isolated, isolated case. case. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that tells us something really interesting about what's going on because, um, well, see if you can figure out what's similar about all these places where it happened. Um, in okay. 1247, it happened in Erfurt. Okay, in Erfurt. Yeah. In, where we had 100 kids dancing out of the town to the next town over. Okay. So not, Moving the problem. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and not too dissimilar from the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Of kids being led out of the town, dancing mm-hmm. their way away, and some of these kids were found dead. Oh, um, wow! Okay, the town not murdered, but exhausted. Exhausted from dancing. Um, Maastricht in twelve seventy eight. Okay, uh, where two hundred people are dancing so violently on a bridge over the River Meuse that it just collapses. Ah, oh. yup. Um, and then in thirteen seventy four, you have a huge epidemic that goes from Aachen to Metz to Zurich to Strasbourg. Um, where wandering groups of dancers go from Whoa. town to town, spreading the epidemic. That's correct. Is this? I, I is it not maybe some some type of cult or religion? Good thinking, because they're all geographically similar places. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's, it's localized to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not global, mm-hmm. um, but it's definitely some kind of cult. Yeah, but then why would they be screaming in agony? So that's the thing, because people are going through a lot of pain. Mm. And, then and I suppose maybe, well, some religions have that, don't they? You, 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 you pray to God and you have, you, you have your ways of your, of your religion that you do anything, mm. even if it means sacrificing oneself. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe this could be linked to it, but linked to that one person in Strasbourg, mm. just a random person, an argument with a husband. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a weird person to... <laughs> it is, but, but we'll we'll come back to this idea of kind of a religious understanding of pain because I think that's probably the most cogent theory. Okay. But let me tell you the other theories. The first theory was by a, a doctor um, called Dr. Paracelsus, um, which was not his birth name. He chose that <laughs> <for himself. laughs> in 1526, so only a few years later, eight mm-hmm. years after. And his interpretation was they're all whores and sluts. <laughs> Of course. Of course. Of course. And because they're all whores and sluts, then they need more God in their life. And yeah. so by going to the shrine, God cured them of their sluttish ways. I see. Is that, yeah. So uh, the idea that they're all whores is, <laughs> I think we can discount that. I think so. Yeah. Second idea is something called ergotism, ergot poisoning. Uh, well, I, I thought maybe it's something to do with this something in the air. Mm. Like literally a something in the air. Because there is that, that, that famous uh, story in Kazakhstan, there was a village that kept sleeping mm-hmm. and no one knew why and it was something to do there where they were fracking and there was oh, a gas right. that was exposed as a result and it meant that the whole population became narcoleptic because uh-huh. <laughs> they're just being poisoned poisoned yeah yeah, yeah. so i thought maybe this was well, something similar a, a similar idea well it's not in the air this um ergot what it is it's a mold that grows on rye okay so when you grow rye and it's damp then a mold grows it's like a mushroom mm-hmm. and like many mushrooms it can cause hallucinations and it can cause delusions as well mm-hmm. 
And we know that people in this area suffered from ergot poisoning because if you look at the apparatus they use to put the ground rye into bags, mm -hmm. it's covered in demons and twisted faces and kind of hallucinatory Ooh. imagery. Okay. As if to say, careful with this stuff, it can, it can bonk you out, it can make you go mental. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, and the other thing about, is about ergot poisoning is that it's very chemically similar to um, an acid called lysergic acid. Ah, okay. Which, as I'm sure you know, LSD. LSD, yeah. yeah. Lucy in the Sky of Diamonds. That's the one. So the thinking is everybody was just having a massive LSD trip. Oh. And if you take them away from the town for a day, then they're not eating the same rye. Problem is with that. But thinking, isn't there other people not dancing in Strasbourg? There are plenty of people not dancing in Strasbourg. And ergot poisoning cuts off the circulation to the limbs. Oh, you can't feel it? And so, well, you can feel it. You can feel your feet rotting. Your feet just oh, start I to see. rot. Oh, you get okay. Gangrene. Yeah, yeah. So the idea that you would dance whilst your feet are gangrenous oh. doesn't quite work. No, doesn't I see the point work. you're making there. Yeah, you, that's, you, so is that, yeah. That, and, and also there have been many, many outbreaks of ergot poisoning. The most recent one that we know of was in 2001. Oh, wow. For example. Uh, none of them have dancing involved. Okay. Well. So it just doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> so what I think the best interpretation is, um, is similar to what you were saying, and this comes from a book called A Time to Dance, A Time to Die. Okay. It's a very good title. That's a by, lovely title. Um, a historian in Michigan called John Waller. And he says, in order to understand what was going on, we have to understand the people. So let's look at their context. What was happening? We've had famine on and off for about a thousand years by this point in mm -hmm. time, since the fall of the Roman Empire. The plague is back and is enormous. And the plague is the most horrific way of dying you can imagine. Mm -hmm. You're healthy on the Monday. By Tuesday, you've got buboes under your armpits. By Sunday, they've exploded, they're black, and you're dead. Nice. It just takes you immediately. And if you're worried about that, by the way, dear listeners, uh, it's caused by bacteria. Just get antibiotics. You'll be fine. Yeah. But of course, they didn't have antibiotics. So the plague Not would yet. come <laughs> and just appear out of nowhere and just kill thousands of people um, in a town. So we've got famine. We've got the plague. We've got war because it's the Rhineland. Okay, and yes. The, Rhineland, the only time the Rhineland has not been at war is in our parents' lifetime. Yeah. Like post 1945 is the only time that the Rhineland has not been in conflict. Ever. I mean, it was the limits of the Roman Empire. Mm. Like literally ever. Has, this has always been conflict at this yeah. point. And for these guys, they were facing invasion by the Turks in the east who had oh. reached Vienna or who would go on to reach Vienna. And in the back of everyone's mind was the constant threat of utter destruction. So we've got famine, we've got plague, <laughs> we've got war. We've got syphilis, which has just appeared, <laughs> brought over from the New World. Oh, God. And as I'm sure you know, syphilis is just horrific. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Eats your brains, eats your bones, oh. destroys you very quickly. I mean, you wouldn't want to buy a house there. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I mean, everyone's syphilitic at this point in time. Henry okay. VIII had syphilis, and that explains quite a lot of what he did in his later reign. Um, William Shakespeare may have been syphilis, which is why he doesn't write any real plays for the last 10 years of his life mm -hmm. everyone has syphilis um and the way that the people are interpreting all of this is through their version of christianity right which is not the same as our version of christianity at no all. our version of christianity is kind of badly sung hymns and <laughs> old people with bad breath standing around cups yeah. of tea and it just remembers on sun songs of praise on a sunday afternoon exactly <laughs> exactly just a sea of gray hair yes but their version of christianity is uh I mean, it's very black metal. It's oh. kind of incense everywhere, candles everywhere, oh. demons painted on the walls. Very mystical, very, very psychological. Um, it's not a concept. We can kind of choose to be religious or not. Mm. Kind of, you go to church, you're religious. You decide whether or not you believe. Mm -hmm. But for these people, the religion was the, the way that they saw the world. Okay. They didn't interpret the world um, in any other lens other than through Christianity. And so you are seeing a world that is being destroyed your world is being destroyed because there is war there is plague there is famine there is death there are the four horsemen of the apocalypse yes and they are everywhere how do you cure that world through the church because you see the world through the church mm -hmm. now the church at this point in time is disgustingly corrupt okay it is absurdly corrupt <laughs> and just one little tidbit to show to you how corrupt the church is please a uh, a local investigator 
investigator in Strasbourg um, went around all the monasteries to see what was going on. And in just one monastery, he found the bodies of five babies oh. that had been buried in the cloister because they'd been killed by the nuns who'd given birth to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Babies. That's insane. We are talking <sighs> highly risk levels. Of, we're not just talking kind of people getting drunk when they shouldn't be getting drunk. No, the, these the, are. I mean, that's these are evil people. That's a, that's these awful. Yes, yeah. So, if the way that you can see the world being cured is through this group of people who are doing everything wrong, then what can you do? No. There is oh. no way that you can cure the world through the church at this point in time. This is why the Reformation is about to happen. It okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. That's why they reform the church. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're one woman who's just had a massive <laughs> argument with your husband and syphilis is in the air and the Turks are just over the border... Fuck it, let's dance. Let's just dance. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, it's not quite as joyous as that. It's not like we're dancing at the end of the world. It's not like we may as well have fun. Oh. It's, it's a way of, well, the way that John Waller puts it is, is her way of processing trauma. She has had a traumatic life. The yes. people in Strasbourg have a traumatic life. And when you have a traumatic life, you have to deal with it. Because if you don't deal with it, your unconscious mind will make your conscious mind deal with it. Yes. So, for example, in the First World War, soldiers come back from the First World War suffering from shell shock, post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress disorder. But it manifests in different ways for different soldiers in the First World War. For the infantry, they often go mute. They might go blind. They might suffer from tremors. They might be paralyzed. Oh Very my physical. God, yeah. But for the officers, they would suffer from anxiety. They would suffer from depression. As is mental. They would suffer from nightmares. It's a mental affliction. Because for the infantry, their job is physical, to use their bodies. Yes. For the officers, their job is mental, to use their minds. And so for... Uh, Frau Trophea, the way that she processes this trauma is to go into a religious trance and the only way that that religious trance can be cured is by religious means. Um, and so taking her to the shrine did actually genuinely cure her, not because God was cursing her, oh, wow. but because the way that her unconscious was processing this trauma was religious. Oh my God. So actually that shrine saved... Uh, Save 400 people's lives. So, wow. Otherwise they would have danced themselves to death. So this is not mental people. This is just how their brains have been wired at the, in the context and where they're living. Exactly. And this is one way in which their trauma, tra trauma is manifesting. Mm. And thus the way to do it is to release that through mm. a shrine. And so the trance-like state that they go into is exactly the same trance state that the soldiers went through in the First World War or exactly the same trance state that we might go into if we suffer from a psychosomatic illness, mm. which I certainly have done. I've had a period of illness where I ended up with some symptoms that actually weren't physically in my body. They were psychosomatic. Right. Exactly the same thing. Oh just the way God. that we process it. We believe in science. We believe in medicine. Otherwise, placebos wouldn't work. Placebos do work. Yeah. To some extent. Because we have that belief, the way that we process stress and trauma is medical. And this is why, when we both got in today, I said, I'm a bit under the weather at the moment. And you said, yeah, I always feel a bit under the weather after term. Mm, that is true. Because we've been through this period of enormous stress at school. School is a stressful thing. The way that we process it is by getting ill for a little bit. Yeah. And, and then, then we heal. And then we heal and we go again. And then she healed. That's why we never hear of her again. Oh, so it she actually worked. She had to do something. That's crazy. And that was religious. My God. And so she entered this trance state. And trances are everywhere in human culture. Every single human culture that we've ever come across has some kind of trance state, be it religious, be it music. And this is why, I mean, when, this is why when you said, when I asked you how long have you danced for, you wouldn't have danced for three hours if it wasn't for music playing. But the music puts you into a bit of a trance. Puts you into that mode. Yeah. Oh my God. That's incredible. Isn't the brain a weird place? It is a weird and wonderful thing. And it's mm. mad that, you know, the, the, the human evolution, the evolution of everything has come up with something which is so powerful that it, mm. it can even destroy itself. Mm -hmm. mm. No, it's, a, it's an expression of the unconscious. It's, I am suffering. And, and I think the, and the, the, the conclusion that John Waller comes to here is why do we do this? Why do we manifest stress physically? Mm. And his idea is that uh, the way it works is you need help. You mm. are asking for help. But you can't just outright say, I'm having a really difficult time here and I need help. 
and because that's a very difficult thing to do. You have to be extraordinarily vulnerable and honest to be able to say, look, I'm suffering here and I need your help. Yeah. And especially if you think of Frau Trophea, she hates her husband. And not just in a kind of marital spat kind of, uh, what are we having for dinner? Oh, but we had that yesterday kind of hatred. No, yeah. she viscerally hates him. She cannot stand the sight of him. But she, she needs help from somewhere. And so the way that she asks for help is by going through this religious process. And the wow. way that we ask for help is by going through a medical process. So it's just their way of healing. Exactly. And it's their, oh, wow. The that's unconscious in- needs to heal sometimes. That's incredible. And it will make the conscious do weird things. That's mad. What a weird thing the brain is. So there you go. That's trances are very important to human beings in a way that we just can't quite fathom because the unconscious brain is a weird, weird place. It is. Through most of that, I was tranced by your explanation. <laughs> Not, I was in completely engrossed in what you were saying. Thank you. So very enjoyed that. Interesting stuff. There's, yeah. I mean, you can see why I kind of almost had to cancel this episode to finish reading that book. Of course, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just to, if anybody wants to read more about this, we'll, we'll tweet out a link to this book. Yes. And it's called A Time to Dance, A Time to Die by John Waller. It's only about 150 pages, so you can finish it in a day. And it is fascinating, The just what the brain can do to itself. Oh, yeah. Offering listeners extra reading. Excellent. There you go. Go and do your homework. Now. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be a test next week. <laughs> So just thinking about trances, mm. and, and I do know that you can, for example, you can do trances on animals. So mm-hmm. I, I watched something or read something about in Maine in USA where they have lo- lots of lobster farms where they can um, put lobsters in trances before they boil them. Uh-huh. So they turn them upside down and they and essentially when you turn them upside down, they bend their tail back over their heads slightly, which is quite right. cruel actually. But you are about to boil them, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> um, they don't move. They're in a trance. It's not because they're like, completely incapacitated they're They're just completely paralyzed because whether they just they're focused on like the body position of something like that but they're not in any pain they're just Uh completely tranced oh wow very similar to what chickens do as well Mm. which is where if you if you get a chicken and uh head uh obviously this is alive by the way (laughs) not 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 actual witchcraft (laughs) But you get it, and what you do, you get a, like a chalk piece of chalk, and you draw mm. a line on the a white line on the floor, and the chicken will just stare at the line and not and move, move at all. Puts itself uh-huh. into a trance, uh-huh. which I love. How did someone find out about that? <laughs> <laughs> what were they doing? Too much chalk and not enough things to do. Yeah, yeah. And the thing about the pain, so lobsters can overcome pain um, when they're in trance. I think that's similar to what was going on with with Frau Trophea, why her mm. feet didn't stop her. Yeah. And um, Roger Bannister, the long distance runner, oh, yeah. said something similar along these lines where um, somebody asked him, what did it feel like? And he said, I just didn't feel my legs at all when I was running a sub four minute mile um, for the first time ever. It just felt like I was pure consciousness, just flowing along the track with no legs, no mind, no nothing. That's, but kind it, of The state of flow is a trance where yeah. you, your consciousness shifts and your normal perception changes. And it's why, as I say, it's why, as a person that plays video games, it's, and some, that's why sometimes people can play video games, for example, like 12 hours, 13 hours straight. Mm. It's because they're so focused. They are that entrancing. They, they forget what, everything around them. Yeah. Or why you can binge watch a TV show for five, six, seven hours. Because yeah. you are entranced. Wow. Part of your brain has been quieted. The part of your brain that tells you, I really should move because this is done to hurt my bum. Sat down for 12 hours, 12 hours time. straight. <laughs> that's been switched off because it's been taken over by the part of your brain that's enjoying the creativity of it. I see. So, well, I do know there's, a, there's injury to my chair at the moment I'm sitting on. You may have realised I'm sitting on a cushion now. Aha. The lever of my chair is whatever material it is and now split apart because my backside's been on for too long. <laughs> You've worn through <laughs> it. I've worn through the chair wow. by sitting still. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Trance injury collateral from my chair. Pretty good game, Sam. Pretty good game. Yeah. Yeah. So it's number time, Will. Number time. Number time. So mm-hmm. just to remind the listener, I would say a number and a, a, a like a little clue, and Will has a couple to go to try and work out. I do have an extra clue again, but work out what the fact might be. And my number this week, very similar to yours last time, is zero. Mm-hmm. Is that a number? That's conceptual. We could <laughs> let's not worry about that. And um, 
The clue is Saudi Arabia. So zero and Saudi Arabia. Zero and Saudi. Is it the number of times I want to visit Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Do we have any, any Saudi? We have no listeners in Saudi Arabia at the moment. I do, Saudi Arabian people are lovely people. I've known many of them. They're <laughs> lovely people. I, I'm just afraid I have zero interest in visiting them. Yeah, they're exactly the same uh, viewpoint of me as Egypt, bizarrely. Uh huh. Because I, I've been to, I've been, bizarrely been to Egypt, but to Sharm el Sheikh. So that doesn't count. No, it's not. That doesn't really count as no. Egypt. No, I have no desire really to go to Egypt. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm probably missing out on a lot, but uh, I don't mm-hmm. know why that's one of the places. But um, no, that's not. Well, it might be the answer for you, <laughs> not, <laughs> but uh, it's not the answer I'm looking for. Okay. Uh, but the extra clue is the hydrological cycle. Hydrological cycle. Okay. Uh, so we're, we're talking rain. Now, I do happen to know that the desert in Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. is extraordinarily dry. Extraordinarily it is pretty dry. Hot. It's called the empty quarter, I think, is what it's translated yes. as. Whatever that is in Arabic. So I'm going to guess the average rainfall over... Saudi Arabia is zero millimeters. Oh, it's a, it's a really good guess. It's not the answer though, okay. but you're on the right tracks with this kind of it being dry. Mm-hmm. So Saudi Arabia is the biggest country in the world without mm. a river. Oh wow, it doesn't have a single river. Not in a it. single river whatsoever. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, so wow. so they have um, they have something called wadis, mm-hmm. which is uh, basically a dried river bed which is where sometimes when it does rain in, um, in Saudi Arabia, they fill up as an oasis, and lots of communities are based around these oasis. Mm. And at the bottom, of a, a, bottom of, of a wadi, which used to be a river, it's like a, a, a ephemeral river, so it happens mm. seasonal sometimes. Right. Uh, so at the bottom of these wadis, they have very fine silt, uh, mm-hmm. And it looks like there used to be a river running through at some point, mm-hmm. uh, but there have been sometimes some crops are based around there uh, in in history where people have settled around where there was an oasis, but then it's dried up over time. Right. Sometimes it might have flash flooding mm-hmm. uh, because sometimes it have in the desert. Sometimes you do have flash flooding rain, and these wadis fill up, and mm-hmm. then there's lots of water for a while, and then it goes away again. But there's no naturally flowing river at all across all of Saudi oh, Arabia, no. and Saudi Arabia is not small. No. It's not a small country. It's vast. No, it is, it's huge. For yeah. it to not have a river is quite extraordinary. That is. But then that explains why there are so few inland cities in Saudi Arabia. Because mm. I can think of Riyadh, Mecca, Medina, and that's it. That's I it, yeah. Is on the but coast. Riyadh's quite central as it, as it goes. I think it's, it's not, not on the coast. It's not a coastal city. No, not at city, all. No, is it's it? bang in the middle. Yeah. Is but, it where the, probably where the oil is, no doubt. You, yeah, I would guess so, because it's a very modern city. It's part of the OPEC, I think, the mm. oil producing exporting countries organization. Yeah. Yeah, but that's where obviously where their wealth comes from. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so there's no there's no rivers whatsoever. Um, mm-hmm. And just to, to give you its size, so it's two point one million kilometers squared. That means absolutely nothing to me. Fair enough, but this <laughs> might mean something to you. All of water, so, so all of Saudi Arabia, mm. uh, there is only zero point seven percent surface of, of which is water. Zero point seven percent. Yeah, that's. Okay, that does mean something to me. That might mean a lot more to you, yeah. Yeah, there's probably more water in a raisin. If you said Saudi Arabia, yeah. Because yeah. it raisin you get as a kid in that little mm-hmm. box. Yeah, mm-hmm. there might well be. But just to sort of finish what I went off, uh, to sort of give you a concept of places that don't have rivers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, Saudi Arabia is very unique in that sense because it's an actual country, like mm-hmm. an actual sized like country when you think that's a country <laughs> yeah yeah because there are places around the world which you go it's a country but it's not a country really yeah so uh but you get <laughs> you're about to get into some <laughs> geopolitical <geographical> problems here <laughs> <laughs> yeah because san marino what's the point <laughs> what exactly well it goes it leads on to this oh, like dear. you got places like eritrea and djibouti yep. which are sort of eastern african nations not far from saudi arabia mm-hmm. oman mm-hmm. Uh, these don't also don't have rivers as well oh interesting um but Shape, so they're like smaller countries but then mm. There are other, obviously, archipelago countries mm. don't have rivers. They don't really need it if it's an archipelago. Not really. Is it like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, as it links to last week? They Tuvalu. haven't got. Yeah. You're obsessed, man. I am obsessed with Tuvalu, yeah. <laughs> it's just on the brain. And the trance. <laughs> Tuvalu. Tuvalu trance. Tuvalu trance. That's a good a new wave band, isn't it? That would be an outstanding <laughs> evening. And uh, obviously countries like um the vatican city san marino mm-hmm. don't have rivers just mm-hmm. because they're city states that's just a hill yeah yeah it's pretty much so yeah so they're the countries that don't have uh, rivers but saudi arabia is quite notable because of its size yeah that is so it's just one big desert pretty much uh-huh yeah and it's not it's not like there's only 10 people there like there are millions of people oh, there's a lot of people living there absolutely yeah. i mean riyadh's pretty impressive have you seen pictures of riyadh i have it's yeah. like skyscrapers long you know long, very long straight roads and mm-hmm. lots of you know fancy cars and i mean it's quite developed great as a, big building in the middle that looks like a bottle opener yeah yes yes 
Yes, you're right. It does. I've never thought that. Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The name escapes me the building, but you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can picture it. Mm-hmm. But no, it, and, and, and around it is just vast desert land. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no... There's a, a village near where my parents live because my parents essentially live in the Shire. They live in Hobbiton. Okay. Um, and there's a village nearby called Winterbourne Stoke, which is named after a river there that is similar to a wadi in that it only appears in the winter. It's uh, Winterbourne. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. Oh, a yeah. Winterbourne. Okay. You're less likely to get your hand chopped off in Winterbourne Stoke than in Saudi Arabia. That is true. Yeah, that's true. Um, yes. A different context yeah. entirely. <laughs> <laughs> you might get nipped by a passing badger. <laughs> But <laughs> you won't have that in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you won't have that in Saudi Arabia. No. Okay, so my number is five, mm-hmm. and my topic is Beethoven. Okay, five and Beethoven. So Beethoven, mm-hmm. famous composer. Mm-hmm. Correct? Correct. I got that right. Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, strong start. <laughs> <laughs> five. Uh, I'm gonna, my, my initial thoughts there are age when he wrote his first piece or something. Okay. Some, I like that idea. Something like that. The uh-huh. first notable piece, or oh, that's what I'm going to go with. They're, they're, all the great composers are known to be prodigies, like Mozart would turn up and just, he'd hear a song once at the age of four and then just play it perfectly okay. and improve upon it. Um, but no, that's not the correct that's answer. That's not the case. correct answer. No. Is there an extra clue? That there can... is an extra clue, yes. It's to do with his last ever appearance. Last ever appearance. Mm. I'm going to go with... Uh, his last ever appearance to perform is that right? Mm-hmm. Or was only five minutes long. Okay, interesting idea. But no, I was thinking not. more like Tommy Cooper death style <laughs> thing. Do you know what I mean? Just die yeah. on stage. No, he didn't. No, okay. fortunately um, for everyone in the audience, <laughs> yes. I love that Tommy Cooper story. It's what great. A fantastic way to it, die. Out of all ways to go that I know of 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 any of anyone famous like that. Mm. That's my favourite one yeah. because that literally, to the point, died by doing what you love. Yeah, and, and I, making people laugh. And making you do people it. laugh while you do it. It's one of my most favourite deaths <laughs> of all time. Yeah, it's like a race car driver dying in a race, except he made people laugh whilst doing it. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. but no, it's not that. No, so. Um, what do you know about Beethoven? Oh, was he from Bonn? Is this he was a, from Bonn, yeah. I know he's from Bonn. Yeah. Uh, and I know that he was, didn't his father or his parents always tell him to come out um, like one in the morning to play in a pub because he was so impressive? Mm, I didn't know that. Maybe, or maybe I'm mixed up with another composer. I it could well be. But yeah. I know that happens to, maybe I'm thinking of Liszt, I don't know, but it's... Uh, Liszt was kind of a rock star of his age. Okay. For sure. And he... List played the piano so hard that he split the strings. That's like, insane. I don't even know how you do that. Jeez, how'd you manage that? I don't know, but he just, he shagged his way across late 18th, uh, 19th century Europe. Oh my like, goodness me, did his piano have legs? <laughs> the covers around it. He was an absolute pianist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're doing so well. We're. Boom, boom. <laughs> so, no, so um, his, so Beethoven in old age mm. gets death completely stone death oh, we More said death no he, he does get death everyone gets death <laughs> yes, yes good point sick transit gloria mundi no he he goes death okay um he can just about hear very very loud noises okay or very very low noises so oh. the rumbling of an organ in the church he can hear right but he can't hear anything else so how would he compose was by using ear trumpets which does what it says on the tin <laughs> Or he rigged up a little metal mouthpiece onto his piano that he would bite, and the vibrations of the piano would then travel up into his brain. That's incredible. It's so cool. That's a really oh yeah. That's that you know that's mitigation extreme. Yeah. But that means that performing is quite difficult. It is, <laughs> and composers at this point in time would often conduct. That's how they made their money by okay. conducting an orchestra, mm-hmm. um, standing at the front, waving your arms, telling them how to play at a particular time. Uh, in 1824, Beethoven makes his first appearance since he's gone deaf. And okay. it's in Vienna because he lives in Vienna because everybody interesting lives in Vienna. Yep. And um, he is deaf. He's completely deaf. So he can't hear what the orchestra is actually doing. So they've got a second conductor to actually conduct oh. whilst Beethoven just stands there and waves his arm about. Oh, so he's just like the star of the show that doesn't yeah. do anything at that point. Turn up to watch Beethoven nobody's paying attention to him in the orchestra at all. Okay, so Beethoven's turned out to watch Beethoven. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, the the occasion, the reason why he's doing this is because it's his ninth uh, symphony, okay. which is his greatest piece of work by far, like one of the most remarkable pieces of music. Um, everybody knows the Ode to Joy from Beethoven's mm-hmm. ninth symphony. And the problem is, because he's deaf, 
he can't keep up with the orchestra. Okay. And so the orchestra comes to the end and it's this massive chord at the end and they stop and the audience start applauding and Beethoven's still waving his arms about, still conducting, <laughs> lost in the music, in a complete trance. And one of the soloists, because um, it's also a choral piece, so one of the singers comes up and kind of grabs him and turn around and mm -hmm. physically turns them around <laughs> and everybody's going mental hats in the air people waving rather than Go. clapping because they know they can't he can't hear so he's just going oh okay. that must be very weird for people who can hear yes yeah <laughs> just waving your arms in the air like <laughs> that's where we're doing right as now i'm doing right now yeah <laughs> and they and they applaud and give him a massive standing ovation and he kind of starts crying because it's an extraordinarily emotional event mm -hmm. and then the applause dies down and then it builds up again and everybody gets on their feet again and starts oh, waving okay. and throwing their hats. And they do that. How many times? Five. Five times. Hey. There we go. <laughs> he gets five standing ovations. Five even standing ovations. Stone deaf. Cannot hear a thing. But because everybody's throwing their hankies in the air and hats and waving. Um, they run out of hats eventually. <laughs> you <laughs> just catch someone else's and throw that. Yeah, like a mortar board at university. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. Five stand ovations for Beethoven. Yeah, but I've got can't... a secondary fact there as well. Oh, go know, for it, yeah. Do you know how on. many minutes of music you can get on a CD? 192. Uh, it's a lot fewer than that. It's exactly 74. Do you know oh, why it's exactly 74? Why is it exactly 74? Because that's exactly the length of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. They made the CD to be exactly as long as Beethoven's Ninth. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to end with that. I go. did not know that. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. They based it all on that. Yeah. It's, here's the best piece of music ever and we need to get it on this cd get it all on one cd that's all you need yeah so and then oh so there's so you have so is it, every piece of music that you can fit on a cd has to be based around the fact of that Beethoven's if it's longer month, than 74 minutes you need, you need two album. cds yeah oh wow yeah. well who do you think you are better than beethoven <laughs> you can <laughs> trim it come on <laughs> So thank you for listening to our podcast. I think I'm facted out and uh, I'm exhausted of all of my facts for today. I'm sure you are, Will, as well. I'm all stuffed like a <laughs> Christmas fact goose. <laughs> sounds, sounds tasty. <laughs> Is that how you bore your family at Christmas? As long as I don't get indigestion, then yeah. <laughs> but thank you for listening to the podcast. I don't know what that means. No, nor do I. But we're keeping it in. <laughs> yes, we are. Uh, but if you'd like to follow us, we have a Twitter, which is at Gaps Podcast. And we're also on YouTube at Gaps in Knowledge Podcast. And you can find us there. And you can email us, uh, gapsinknowledge at outlook.com. And if you still use Facebook, then just search for Gaps in Knowledge and you should find us. And number one thing you can do, though, is just tell a friend. Tell someone about the podcast. That'd be nice if you do that. Yeah. Cool. But thank you very much for listening, and we will see you in the next episode. Yeah. B bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>